Well, let's start the day. Our first speaker. He's retired from the U.S. Navy as a crypto linguist with over 30 years experience in foreign language and linguistics, including the collection, transcription, analysis, and reporting of voice communications. He is a two-time graduate of the U.S. Navy, Crypt Navy Cryptology Voice Transcription School in Russian and Spanish, and has logged thousands of hours of voice transcription in his target languages, as well as in Persian. He is currently teaching Russian, Spanish, Persian, philosophy, Persian philosophy, Rus oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> and comparative religions at uh, Wentworth College here in Missouri. Um, this man is uniquely qualified to analyze voice signatures from Bigfoot. Please join me in welcoming Scott Nelson. There you are, sir. Thank you. Thank you uh, for having me, first of all. And I know I've been approached a couple times as you don't look at all like your picture. <laughs> this, is a, <laughs> this is a pretty recent development, I must tell you. Um, <laughs> I've, uh, well, when COVID hit, uh, they did away with my position as the uh, department head of philosophy and languages at the college, because they decided they were just gonna go to remote teaching of languages using uh, Rosetta Stone and Duolingo and stuff like this. And I told them, I said, you can't teach language, language in that way. You know, you can learn how to find out where the nearest tavern is, you know, but you can't, <laughs> you can't really teach a, a language. And you certainly cannot train people to be linguists, professional linguists. So anyway, I, this, so, I've, so I've been, the last couple of years, I've been living on a sailboat. And that didn't, that didn't sound good, you know, to put that in a pamphlet, so I just left that out. And, um, and I've been working on our study, which is not complete. And, and uh, you will see that this study should probably never be complete, because people should, be, should carry on my work after, uh, you know, me and Ron are long gone. Um, <clears throat> but anyway, my, my son, <laughs> the other day, my son looked at me and said, Dad, what? What, what are you trying to go for there? <laughs> and I go, I says, well, maybe Herman Melville. <laughs> he goes, oh, is he, did he write The Old Man and the Sea? And I said, no. <laughs> I said, he, he wrote the best, the greatest book ever written, about Moby Dick. And I was, of course, we, I mean the second greatest book ever written, of course. Uh, <laughs> And so I says, no. I'm, and he says, well. and then my other son says, maybe the prophet Elijah. <laughs> and then Stephen, of course, comes in, no, you mean Methuselah. I said, no, come on, give me a break. <laughs> um, anyway, I, I'm here to, uh, to present my study of the Barry Moorhead tapes. And uh, normally I don't have to go in, because this, by the way, this is the first UFO conference I've ever done. I've done several dozen Bigfoot conferences, and in almost all of those, people already know what the Barry Moorhead tapes are. Um, but John reminded me the other day, yesterday, he says, nobody's gonna know what the Barry Moorhead tapes are. So these were um, two tapes that were uh, collected by um, Alan Barry in 1972, and um, Ron Moorhead in 1974 at the same location that has uh, really the uh, most famous Bigfoot camp in the world. And it's referred to as the Sierra Camp. Um, since that, uh, well, I'm, I'm gonna play you snippets of these, of the tapes, and I'm going to demonstrate to you the um, transcription process that I was trained in and that you have to use uh, in order to study these tapes. But, um, and by the way, it's not surprising to me that I was asked to speak at a UFO conference 
because it, it, to, to me and Ron, at least, uh, we, have, we began about six years to see, six years ago, to see a, almost a meshing or a melding of these different genres, especially because of um, the high strangeness of some of the things that Ron and I have experienced up there at the Sierra Camp and things that, that Ron on his own uh, and the hunters before that experienced up there at that camp. Um, it goes beyond this idea that there's a, a big, hairy forest brother that lives in, you know, undiscovered, lives on top of mountains. It goes way beyond that. Um, in fact, when I first got involved um, in this, I was trying to find Ron because I had stumbled on these sounds. And um, the first pe person I called was uh, Matt Moneymaker. Does any of you guys see the, the show, The Finding Bigfoot? He put that show together. Now, I'm very good friends with uh, two of the guys, Chris Barkman and Bobo Fay. Done many, many uh, conferences with them and, and sort of became brothers with them as well. Um, but when I first, when we first started out, I was told by Matt, first person I called was Matt Moneymaker. Because um, I needed to find Ron Moorhead. I, I didn't know, even know his name at the time. All I needed to find uh, was the guy who had made these recordings. So I called Matt Moneymaker, and uh, he says, don't you dare. I told him what I, was, what I was hearing. He says, don't you dare come into our Bigfoot community and tell us that Sasquatch has language. He says, we have struggled for so many years um, just to try to get a Bigfoot study uh, to be a serious academic thing. He says, if you start bringing up um, the idea that Sasquatch has a language, he says, it'll, it'll blow us out of the water. So he refused. He wouldn't tell me. He wouldn't give me any information about uh, you know, where to find the guy um, who made these recordings. And then, um, by divine in, in, you know, intervention, almost, I get a call a couple days later from one of his top researchers who had caught wind of what I was doing of what I was looking for, and she, her name was Caroline Curtis, and um, I owe her a lot, never met her. I'm still looking for that moment when I get to meet her and thank her for what she did. She went out of her way to call me and to give me all the information on Ron Moorhead, um, an entrepreneur, restaurateur. Uh, he owned a hotel and a, a restaurant in Mariposa. California, right at the gates of uh, Yosemite. Um, so I made a phone call to him. And he was in his office, and of course, the first half hour of our phone call, he was quite certain that I was just another one of the Bigfoot crazies until I had him convinced that, that yes, I, I was a two-time graduate of the Defense Language Institute, what we call DLI, right? in Russian and Spanish, and then a further on training for the transcription schools for both languages. Um, so I finally convinced him that, that I was the guy to take a look at this, and he sends, um, I mean, two days later, he expressed me two DVDs with the sounds that you will hear. Um, so, well, let me, let me tell you where I, how it all happened was in uh, 2008. Um, I was teaching at Wentworth College, and we had a Monday where it was a residential college, so the kids didn't go home during holidays. They stayed there, so, so we had to teach on holidays. So it was, I remember it was a Monday holiday, and my son Stephen, who was 12 years old at the time, um, had come with me to school that day. 
and because I didn't want to leave him home by himself. So he, we were at uh, the afternoon get, preparing to leave for the day, and I was on my computer, this new thing, and to me, browsing the internet, and, um, and Stephen says, you know, I've got a, he was supposed to write a paper on any subject of his choice. So I says, okay, well, I can help you out with that. Um, I said, what do you want to write it on? And of course, like every 12-year-old boy in America, it's the oh, dad, either Loch Ness Monster, uh, UFOs, or, or Bigfoot. I said, well, choose one. So he goes, uh, okay, let's go Bigfoot. So I'm just Googling Bigfoot. And um, he says, uh, Dad, um, what do you think Bigfoot's sound like? And I thought back, I remembered some B-grade movie from the 70s. And I goes, oh, it's like, um, um, ah! he goes, Dad, that's, come on, that's not what Bigfoot sound like. Well, later on, I kind of, we kind of find out that really they do kind of sound like that. <laughs> um, when they're not speaking. And he says, okay, so I Googled, I literally Googled uh, Bigfoot uh, sounds, and it brought me immediately up to uh, Money, Matt Moneymaker's very good website, um, the uh, Bigfoot Field Researchers Organization, BFRO for short. So I just, and I saw right there, I said, Bigfoot sounds. So I dropped down and, and I saw samurai chatter. So I, I clicked on it and I was, that's in chatter. That alone implies language. And here it is on Matt Moneymaker's, you know, uh, website. Um, of course, they're not linguists, and I don't expect everybody to know all that. And so I clicked on it. And I heard exactly what you're going to hear tonight. And <laughs> I stopped. And I replayed it again. And I replayed it again. And again, and my, my son saw the look on my face. He said, Dad, what's the matter? I said, wait a minute. And I replayed several more clips again. And I said, son, whatever that is is speaking a language. He said, what are you talking about? It sounds like a bunch of monkeys fighting. I said, son, uh, no, listen. I played it again. He said, no, dad, that's just monkeys fighting. I said, no. I said, Stephen, we have to, we have to get a hold of these tapes and slow it down like dad used to do in the Navy. I swear to God, if you slow that down, you will hear them. They're speaking and articulating sounds exactly. Well, I didn't go into this with him, but they're articulating exactly the sounds that humans articulate with a few extra sounds thrown in. And um, so that began the, the biggest complication of my life ever. But it's, it's, it's been a fun ride, I, I can say. Um, at the, um, at, in that first few moments, I was able to draw three conclusions that I've never, I've never abandoned. One is that these creatures were not human. They were not, uh, this was not a human being, as you will see. You don't have to be an expert cryptolinguist or a doctor of linguistics to hear it. You will hear it yourselves. Um, I said, first off, they're, that's not a human being. Number two, they're speaking a language. And number three, it's not fake. And I drew those, because that's the first thing in my mind, could this be fake? I listened to it again, and there's no, no, it cannot be, and I'll show you why. Why we know it's not fake. And I was not the first one to, to decide this is not fake. Um, so, um, after that, um, and I'd found Ron, I got a hold of the DVDs, or not DVDs, the CDs, um, and I, I transcribed, it took me four months 
to transcribe them. There's over 90 minutes we have in the two tapes. So the transcripts turned out to be 75 pages long. Not published yet, but it's getting close, getting close. Um, so the, the first thing I did was I couldn't believe in the first place I, I, that I had never heard of these, that nobody had ever detected language in these tapes. Um, so, and how I knew that, because I immediately started buying every book on Bigfoot I could find, every book at the library that I could find, and there was, even though uh, Dr. Meldrum had just published a brand new book called Sasquatch Meets Science. Great book. But you go through that, and there's not one mention of these creatures having language. And I could not believe it. That no, but that, could I have been the first one to, to hear that? And <laughs> so, anyway, the, the first thing I did after I got all, all the transcripts done and everything is I made a trip out to California to actually meet Al Berry uh, and Ron. And they were waiting for me in Ron's house with a cold beer and good barbecue. Of course, they didn't know I was, you know, hey, I'm a Kansas City guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I says, so after we talked a little bit, and they had decided, meet me uh, firsthand, that I was a legitimate guy, and that I was probably the right guy to do this study, I said, let me ask you guys, uh, how, how could it be that nobody ever heard language in these tapes before? They had been widely distributed in a Bigfoot community, you know? Um, I said, how come nobody ever, ever knew that there was language? They looked at each other, and they looked back at me and says, said, we've always known. We've always known. I said, really? He said, yeah, but what are we going to do? We're not language guys. We're not. But we knew that they were talking to each other, and that in Ron's case, they were actually trying to talk to Ron. Um, I am quite sure they were actually trying to talk to Ron because in Ron's tape, they actually try to slow their, their utterances down. And in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, they, they actually realized that these hairless little impish apes, you know, are trying to sp speak to them. So, oh, let's, let's see if we can slow our voice down so these stupid little creatures might understand us. Um, that's very evident in Ron's tape. Um, so <laughs> anyway, after that visit, in, um, and, and this started in t the, ev the event with Stephen, that was in 2008. By um, 2010, I'd made enough inroads in the study that I published um, what I call the SPA the Sasquatch Phonetic Alphabet. And since then, I've had to revise it twice, and really, before we go to publication, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to need another uh, uh, revision, mostly due to the fact that it's become evidence that we don't really know what these creatures are. Um, they're beyond what we think they are. It has come to the point where Ron and I have, have realized there's, how Ron puts it, and I agree totally, is um, there is so much more going on here than anybody can possibly imagine. Um, and that's where it stands now. But, you know, this, this started 14 years ago, and I can't even believe that. But... Um, it made it, and in the, those years, me and Ron have, have made uh, 10 expeditions up to the Sierra camp. And the high strangenesses of all of it, from the beginning, um, just took us in places where the, other, the Bigfoot community at that time did not want to go. So we, when we would, and we started almost immediately doing uh, conventions, and... Um, 
But we had a kind of a secret pact. Hey, we're not going to talk about the weird stuff, the paranormal stuff, if you will, because the rest of the Bigfoot community did not want to hear it. At the time, they, um, the consensus was that Bigfoot must be a remnant gigantopithecus who has evolved, you know, and walks upright. And uh, later I found from, a, uh, I find out from a, a biologist who has done a lot of good research in this, he says, there's no evidence that Gigantopithecus ever walked upright. It was just a gigantic gorilla. You know, can gorillas walk upright? Yeah, for a, a few feet. But they don't do it, right? Um, this all changed shortly after we began our study and, and our presentation of our study. Um, the, um, well, I'll come back to a point that I've, I've missed. Oh, um, Ron's, uh, something I need to explain about what we're doing here is because it's often misunderstood to be translation. This is transcription of, of, unknown, of an unknown language, of sounds, right? Um, it's not translation. And Ron's constant mantra was always, hey, Scott, I just want to know what they were trying to say to us. What were they saying to each other? I said, Ron, there's no way to know. This is an entirely unknown language. In fact, to, to translate it, it would, is, is what uh, is called, was called by the, the eminent uh, philosopher and linguist, uh, Dr. Willard Quine. Um, he called it radical translation. This was 50 years ago. He actually speculated, what if, what if we ever um, were confronted with maybe an alien language? or a completely unknown language that we know was not related to any other human language. How would we translate it? So we really have a, a, a kind of a guidebook on how to do this. He called it radical translation. And he says, um, he says, the only place you can start is with the simplest words we have, yes and no. And... Um, we think we have discovered that, at least, only because uh, no is one of the morphemes, or words, if you will, syllables. Um, one of the morphemes that has, it has the highest frequency count in all of the, ta all of the tapes. Now, um, maybe unfortunately, this correlates with all human languages where the word no is the most frequently spoken word in all human languages. Maybe that's sad. I don't know. But, but it's way more frequent than the word yes in all languages. So um, that, that's really, if we're talking about translation, that's where we have to start. And, and that's why I have to tell Ron, I said, look, we're not going to be able to know what they're saying until, we are, uh, until they agree to come and have tea with us. And I can go, okay, when you said, <laughs> you know, did you mean tree or did you mean moon? Or what, you know. That's the only way to verify hum any language is you have to get the meanings of the words from the speaker of that language. Other than that, so... Um, so... Um, the main point being is that this is, uh, what I've been involved in is transcription, not translation. Now we can deduce much of the meaning, but that's as far as, as we can go. Um, then in uh, 2011, so in 2010, I, I published the uh, Sasquatch Phonetic Alphabet, the first one. And then in 2011, I published the, uh, what's called the, uh, the Characteristics of human language. So just to show you, 
this, this is the SPA. And it's written according to the standards of uh, uh, military standards of pro procedure, according to the Navy SOP that, that I was familiar with. Um, and even uh, the, the, the transcription standards by which I was trained. Um, and then this next one here, in 2011 I published this, which is the characteristics of human language evident in the Barry, uh, Barry Moorhead tapes. And we'll, we'll come back to this after you um, hear some of the sounds. So, um, so my, my point with Ron has always been, look, it's, it's enough to, to be able to show that these creatures, whatever they are, they have a language. And that they're not human by the, by the standards which we classify humans, right? But by, by that simple fact of being able to show that they have language, that changes everything. Because if, if we define them by the same standards that we define ourselves as human beings, language, language is what puts the sentience or the sapient, sapience, sapience, in human sapiens, right? Homo sapiens. Um, so it changes everything. And from this, once we started to present the study at uh, Sasquatch conferences, it changed the entire understanding of what these creatures might be. So from that point on, uh, our job is not to prove existence. We never thought it was our job to, to try to prove existence. You got too many people out there trying to do that. Take pictures, whatever. Um, but I have a very simple um, syllogism, logical syllogism. A creature must exist before his language exists. Pretty simple. <laughs> so it was then when um, in, the, in the Sasquatch community that there became a big divide. Those that believed Scott and Ron and those that didn't want to deal with any of that. That they still, and there is still a, a huge segment of, of our population that, that uh, embraces this idea that Sasquatch is just a gigantic gorilla who learned how to walk on two feet. Um, but I think when you hear these, you will, uh, you will all walk away knowing that this is, this is not a big gorilla. In the first place, gorillas do not have the tracheal tree, the vocal cavity, the tongue, the lips, the teeth that we use to produce language. Gorillas, chimpanzees do not have it. They're able to do, they're able to make most of the vowel sounds Ooh, ah, ee, ah, ooh, 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 right? But they cannot, their vocal apparatus, they're not capable of producing what we would call a consonant. Um, so um, that's where we have to start. Um, okay. Let me, you know what I'd like to do? This is the first transcription. This is the transcription of the Barry tape. This was the first page of our first transcription. Okay? And you'll hear, as I play the tape, you'll hear these whistles or that we, I'm certain, is a juvenile. And it does sound just like a whistle. <laughs> As you can see, they're all in capitals. I did that on purpose, uh, according to the key, to, to uh, set off uh, from the human language. Because, and you'll hear that, I mean, they, they sound so much bigger anyway, but in order to, um, on the key, to also be able to put human language, because they interact. The humans are speaking here, as you'll hear. So I had to I find a way to set off the Sasquatch 
utterances from the human utterances. And we can just go through here and, and his first one Ramho Baruhaho. Vambo Huho. No Plamentio. Now, this part here, and you're going to hear this. I just wanted to give you a taste of this before we start. This hu at the end is, um, it, it seems to be a terminal expression. This uh, many languages have. Um, it's uh, Chinese has it. It's a, it's a device, a linguistic device, where when you get done with whatever you're saying to the person you're talking to, you, it, you kind of say over, kind of like CB language. Okay? Hey, uh, that chili on that stove looks good. Those humans made over. And then the other person, the, the female, will speak and say, yeah, it does. So, hey, you distract them while I go steal the, what they have cooking. Over. Okay, and w what it sounds like is the... It's like that. It's, and so that's not really sounds like... It doesn't sound like articulated language the way we would say it. But it obviously has some meaning to them. Nagoku uh, step gakublem down here. Ukuja frape huklech. Yeah, I've been doing this a long time. <laughs> this is, however, what you will hear is I'm I'm making these utterances at probably 50% uh, speed of how fast they speak. So part of what we do when I, when I go up there, to the, when we go up to the uh, Sierra Camp for expeditions, is um, I will get up on the big rock, I'll play the Bolren drum, Irish drum, I'll tell you about that later, um, and I will read from our 75 pages of transcript. And of course, Ron's always teasing me. Boy, he'll hear me say something really crazy. You know, let's see. Wahep do che do fohep. So I, I, I'm up there doing something like that. I have no idea what I'm saying. So Ron will yell, You better be careful. That sounds like a mating call. I said, Oh, <laughs> <laughs> when, you're up, when you're up there so isolated for a week or more, you know, you got to do something to pass the time, right? <laughs> so, um, uh, okay, let's get down to my three conclusions that I drew, and then we'll get right to the tapes, okay? Number one, it's a language. And as you see, I published a whole paper on that. The characteristics of all human language that are very evident in the Barry Moorhead tapes. Okay, everything from uh, the d display of intimidation, emotion, humor, even. I will play you a spot in here where uh, I am quite sure the, sas the big male Sasquatch tells a joke and then laughs at his own joke. <laughs> and Ron, is, after listening to it a lot, he says, boy, I think you're right. I think he thinks he's funny. <laughs> and, and we do know that some of the, <laughs> we're pretty sure that some of their Sasquatch's favorite activity is sc scaring the hell out of us, of course, and, uh, and having fun intimidating us, right, at best. Um, the, it has uh, what we call uh, phonemes and morphemes. When we get into the actual sounds, I'll have to explain to you what that is. Um, a phoneme is a specific sound. So we have to use that, that's a linguistic term, which kind of means a letter or a single sound. L, D, T, whatever, okay? Those uh, linguistically are called phonemes, a single sound. So when you put two or three phonemes together in what we would normally refer to as a syllable or a word, then, um, and that's the only way we can transcribe it. So we, we have no idea what their actual words are. 
even in human languages, it's, it's, it's notoriously difficult to define the term word because a word is something different to one person as, as it is to another. Right? So we, we define these as morphemes. But what we have in these, uh, these sounds is we have things like uh, morphemes that are repeated twice in the same sentence or um, repeated once in the, the query with query inflection. And then they actually, the response from the other creature actually is a response inflection using the same morpheme. Um, we'll come across a couple of these uh, here as we go through. Um, it has, I mean, certainly they have utterance, they have discourse, which is an extended uh, utterance. They have uh, conversational turns, which means that one is speaking to another, letting the other person know they're done speaking, and then she responds. And in um, some, of these, uh, some of these exchanges, these conversational turns that happen between the, the male and the female, um, they're actually stepping on each other. Their, voice, their actual utterances are stepping on each other as if, uh, like they were an old, an old married couple who, where to, one responds to the other one before the other one gets done with what they were asking. Right? You actually hear that. And by the way, that's one of the reasons that we know it's not fake. Not only do we have t uh, two creatures stepping on each other's voice, but we have humans talking with the creatures stepping on them in the background. We know, this cannot be faked. Not even nowadays. Um, and it certainly couldn't have been faked in 1974. Um, okay, it's not human. The reasons we know it's, it's not human, first of all, is what we call the prosody of utterance. This is the rate of deliverance of the, their speech is so fast. And again, for 35 years, no one ever heard that this was a language. And of course, I, I have to believe that it's because of my <laughs> thousands of hours of listening to the human voice on tape and s slowing it down and speeding it up, that that's the only reason that I even had any clue um, so, um, the rate of utterance, the speed of their language is so fast. Now, I've had people say, well, are you saying that they're more intelligent than humans? Of course not. Who knows? You know, I, we do know that once you step two feet into the woods, into their territory, they are way smarter than you and way, way smarter than me. Uh, now, we might be smarter here, you know, in our, our uh, <laughs> paved world, our square structured world, but you, you take two steps into their territory and, and they're the kings of the jungle. There's no doubt in my mind. <laughs> so, okay, the other thing, another thing why we know they're not human is, um, the fr voice frequencies that they use, they go way too high, way beyond the ability of humans, and way too low. Uh, so low, even that we think there might be sounds below the level that humans can hear. Now I've been asked, well, haven't you studied that? And I said, no, we're, we're too busy studying what we can hear. You know, let alone what a machine or a, some uh, technology will tell me, oh, there's sounds above and below that. And said, no, we're not there yet. It wouldn't, it wouldn't do us any good anyway. So that's the other thing. The, the frequency, uh, the fact that they can make sounds that humans cannot. You'll hear them. Um, then there's the, uh, the resonance. Now, that's hard to define, too. Um, 
we know that they, these are gigantic creatures weighing a, a thousand pounds or more. That's four times bigger than any of us, really. And, uh, and so we, have, we assume, and because of the, the bellowing nature of their resonance, we think that their lung capacity must, must also be so large. And they make sounds, they make screams and howls and things that uh, there's actually been uh, some biologists that have um, theorized that they have two sets of lungs or that they have a big set of lung, gigantic set of regular lungs and that they have another set of lungs like up here in the, up here in the throat area, something like baboons or howling monkeys from South America. Of course, that's way beyond, well, any, you know my domain, um, but the, the sheer resonance of it. It's like, who was the guy that had the big booming voice? Uh, that big black guy. Barry White. No, not like that, but James Earl Jones. James Earl Jones. I should have wrote it down here. Yeah, uh, James Earl Jones. We know he has a resonance that is massive much bigger than a regular human. That's why he's used so much. You know? oh, things. And here's, for me, one of the biggest reasons that I know that I could hear immediately that this, that this was not humans trying to fake these hunters out in the first place, um, is that they articulate on the pant. Now, what that means is humans, when we articulate language, it's always on the exhale. Now, on the pant would be on the inhale, right? So like, like a, um, a chimp, who you might go, ooh, 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 right? They are, are, they are articulating that ooh sound both on the exhale um, and the inhale or on the pant. Now, is it possible for humans to do it? Yes, but it's very difficult. You know, I'm, I don't know if I could do this for very long. But you'll, see, you'll hear this, they don't skip a beat. And that may be why they are able to articulate these utterances at such a high speed because they do it in both directions. <laughs> well, here, okay. Finally, uh, it's not fake. Out of my three conclusions, okay. Um, first off, I knew right away, uh, I had been trained in, um, in the art of uh, deception. I was a Russian, I worked the Russian desk for NSA all of our work in, in Navy cryptolinguists, we worked directly for Dernzo, the director of NSA. We sent all of our stuff to them. Um, and I had been trained in all of the, the best um, voice communication deception in the world. And that was the Russians at the time. And there's no way the Russians could try to deceive humans in this way. Um, then there was uh, Ron and Al had sent these tapes um, about 10 years before I came along to a Dr. Curlin at the University um, of Wyoming, still a guy who's, who's really kind of embraced the study himself and has helped us out in ways, but he, he did not have an agenda. Um, and by the way, I did not have an agenda. I do not have an agenda. I just came to realize that I'm probably the only guy that is willing to do the work that this is going to take. Um, and qualified? Yes, I, th I think the only guy that I know that has spent more time um, listening and transcribing the human voice on tape would be the guy who trained me, Master Chief Ralph Blessing. And I was able to locate him when we spoke in Georgia. He came up and listened to him and says, Scott, you're right. 
This is, you're right. And he came to the same three conclusions. Right? Um, then we had a lady by the name of Nancy Logan, another linguist. She said this, but she, even she did not detect it. She had never slowed anything down, but she said, no, this, there's nothing fake about these tapes. Um, and then again, another reason that we know it's not fake is the creatures talking, stepping on each other's voice, and also the creatures and humans stepping over each other's voice. Right? Um, well, let's, uh, let's roll some tapes. And I will demonstrate there, uh, while we're doing it, I'll stop. We will isolate specific, uh, this is not planned out, by the way. I don't have specific utterances already picked out that I'm going to look at. We will just go along, and when we hear something that sounds interesting, then we'll stop it, we'll go back, we'll loop it, we'll listen to it again, we'll slow it down, and you, you will be the ones who will be saying, that's language. So again here, I'm just going to let it roll, and I will, tr I will probably, uh, I'll fast forward through some of the dead air. Right? And again, these first things, you see, these are not linguistic. These, um, I mean, they probably have some meaning. This is the, the uh, juvenile whistling. And the reason that I'm sure it's a juvenile is because in, later on in the tapes, we have the adults also doing little whistles, and they sound, you know, like an adult. Okay. You'll see, look at the, the uh, footprint of the voices. Now, does that sound like apes fighting? It kind of does, at that speed, right? No. For Bikinia, uh, Gigo, whoop me, what's your plan for? <laughs> you hear that? The final thing that's, that's um, I've come to call a concession snarl. We'll, we'll talk about that later. Oh, yeah. Oh, right here. Right here. Befa Wadi, Befa Lulu. But you don't hear that at real time. <laughs> Did you hear him laugh? I'm not the only one that hears that. And this is at real time. Well, that might be enough. Let's go back. Oh, because, yeah, this is where... Uh, <laughs> Before we go back and start listening to this sounds really good, I really need to set up what, what begins to happen here. What had happened is um, Al Berry had taken up some really good, big um, recording equipment. He was a professional journalist who had been scientifically trained, so he was a natural skeptic. And he was, by the way, until he died. Um, his scientific mind would not... Uh, allow him to grasp the concept that these creatures, and certainly once I came along and said, hey, they're, they're speaking in a language, he's, that's, Ron says so, but I, he just couldn't handle it. Um, so he was a, a skeptic till he died. Um, but um, what has happened here is uh, he was up there with several of the hunters, and they decided they were 
going to try to attract the Sasquatches out. And uh, how they decided to do this is they cooked a big pot of stew and left it on their camp stove. And, um, <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> So then, um, it, almost immediately, they heard this stuff. They started hearing this stuff. Uh, and um, they weren't sure that they were getting it. They didn't, had no idea. They had, the, they had the mic set up there outside the camp, right? But where these sounds were coming from were some, for some, some rocks that were a little bit farther away. And the, uh, the hunters... And Al says, God, we need to make sure we're getting that. So they actually come out of the lean-to cabin. And you, you'll hear them. They come out and they discuss, we have to, we have to get this, that microphone closer to where they are so we can make sure that we're getting that. Well, what they didn't know is that the resonance was so great, they caught everything. But so <laughs> what happens is they come out and... <laughs> One guy was picked. He says, okay, you go over by the food and try to get their attention. See, because they're still thinking that these are dumb monkeys. Right? Hey, you go over to... I'm glad I wasn't up there. I wouldn't want to be the guy that was trying to get their attention. Hey, you know, hey, Biggie. You'll hear him. They ended up calling him Biggie. Hey, Biggie, come, come get some dinner. You know. <laughs> um... And while the other, a couple of the other guys, including Al, they were trying to sneak up and get this microphone closer, right? Uh, which they end up doing, and you'll hear them do this. Um, but that's when, and then they come back, and um, in fact, right here is when they first come out of the lean-to. You'll hear the big male begin to get aggressive. So, <laughs> And eventually, you'll also hear it, it's, he gets so mad, eventually he's, it's just the way I, I've been when Kansas City Chiefs lose or something. You know, you, this is something that humans do, right? So um, when they didn't go back and immediately go back in and hide inside the lean-to, he gets very aggressive. And then a sound later on, and, and then it's like the female comes out and calms him down. Like she's actually saying, uh, hey, don't be so mad. They made food for us. Relax. Let's get the food. Then we can scare them. You know? But um, that's just to set up what's actually beginning to happen here. In fact, we'll just play this through before we go back and slow things down. I want you to hear this. I'll go through... Getting upset a little bit. Humans have come out. That's a can you tell the difference between the male and the female? <laughs> Juvenile. Juvenile. And I'll, uh, again, I'll try to get through some of the dead space when we get to it. No. <laughs> you hear him? Now, oh, hey, here. Let me see. Come on, Biggie. Come on now. Do you see how much smaller the human footprint is, the vocal oh, footprint? See how much smaller? That's, that's an indication of resonance, the power that it is. Um. Okay, Biggie, here comes some dinner. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Where'd they sound like they were coming from? That's them walking. Which direction? Which direction was the sounds coming from? They're trying to well, sneak like, this. Straight up in the direction you're going and a little bit to the left. 
And later on, you'll hear the human speaking over and vice versa, the, the creatures. Not right there, Al? Yeah, right there. Leave it right there. Those actual footprints. <laughs> Coming, that's when they're going back. But they didn't go inside. And here's where he begins to slowly lose his temper. That's what I call the concession snarl. He tries the snarls, the screams, to scare him back in. But they're, they're frozen. They don't know what to do with this. there I'd be running off the nearest cliff I'm surrounded by cliffs there's the female that's him re replying they're having a little argument I'm the boss of this family. Hey, mellow out. Let's have, let's have some food. So she, it's like she, event, she calms him down. And this is him settling down a little bit. He's just got to have a last word. And there's the humans by talking again. They don't know what to do. Okay. I'm going to stop it there. You've just heard seven minutes and 49 seconds. We have 90 minutes of this. This is why it took me four months to transcribe it all. And how and why we come up with 75 pages. In fact, right now we've got a problem in how do we reduce those 75 pages to where it can be fit into a book with all the other an analysis and stuff we have to, you know, put into the book. Um, so let's go back to the beginning. In fact, I think I can go right here. And we will run it through again and just stop at different places and I'll show you the transcription process. In fact, I could I could start to slow this down. Now. We find that if we slow it down to about 50%, it starts coming into the human range of of a uh, Prosody deliverance. So you see how much slower it is. No, no. There's that word. Let's, let's isolate this part here. So what we do, we loop it. Now you see, first, the first thing we did is slow it down. And we were trained, Navy cryptolinguists are trained to first off uh, recognize languages that are not our target language. 
I, so that I, we could, we, we have to hit the record button, you know, as we're listening, so that we could send it to the proper people at NSA, the proper desk at NSA. Right? Um, so we had to learn how to transcribe languages that were not our own so that we could send it to NSA. Right? So the first thing we do is, we, certainly if it's an unknown language to us, we have to slow it down. Then, transcription process, once we're sitting at the tape, you know, and by the way, the program that we used in the Navy, the, in, in the Navy in those days, it, it, was, um, it was classified. The computer program itself that used this technique. Now, of course, I go online and you can download a transcription program for 50 bucks, right? I was, so, I was so glad to be able to find that because at the time I'm thinking, how the heck am I going to ever... I didn't know that <laughs> it was public domain now, but it, I found it very quickly. Okay, so we're just going to play this how it would normally be. So... <laughs> Now, did anybody think that they heard them speak specific words there? Did you think that you might have heard, why well, it sounded like those words were kind of, could be some English thrown in there, didn't it? I've, I've had some people say, it sounds like that, um, the female is saying, Falipa uh, Bosch, now go home, okay? which brings up uh, a difficulty. And that is with what we, what we call uh, cognatic words, phrases, or language, okay? A cognate um, to linguists is a word that means the same in English as might mean in Spanish, rodeo, okay, is a cognate. Um, computer. Computador would be a con cognate, a word that is almost exactly the same as it is in another language. Okay, so um, the problem here is this: these tapes are filled with what we would like to say cognates. Okay, now would that make sense? Um, certainly, with English, Spanish, Native American languages. Right? If they've been here for as long as the Native Americans have been here, who knows how much longer, right? you would think when their power of observation is the most important thing uh, to their ability to survive is avoidance of humans, wouldn't we want to go out and kind of learn the language of who, someone who we might think as a, of as a predator? Of course. Right? So it would make sense that they would know and understand some Native American languages. The problem is there are six, over 600 Native American languages. If you include Canada, America, and South America. Right? By the way, they've been detected in South America. Um, an interesting thing, everybody, anybody ever heard of Patagonia? Patagonia, not just the, the clothing brand, which was named after the real Patagonia, which is Argentina, Argentina and Chile in South America, the bottom of South America. When the first um, uh, European explorers were going down there and trying to get past the, the Straits of Magellan down there, they ran into Sasquatches. Or they... What in Spanish, the first explorers down there were Spanish and Portuguese. They, um, they referred to them as patagon. Pata meaning foot or paw, and gon is an emphatic. It's a linguistic convention, a, 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 an emphatic. Uh, gon or on attached to the end of a word means big or big emphasis. For instance, a bald guy would be called uh, pelo is for hair, pelon 
It means you don't have any hair, right? Um, so patagon literally means, in Spanish, the big-footed guy, the bigfoot. So the word Patagonia literally means the land of the bigfoots. You can research this. So if you're wearing Patagonia, you're actually wearing something that should be labeled Bigfoot. All right? Um, so I don't know who got it. Oh, oh cognates. Um, one of the first persons that I took, um, that I had listened to these sounds was a colleague of mine, math guy, um, by the name of Jerry Masuda, native Japanese speaker. And of course, because on the BFRO website, when I first saw it, it said samurai chatter. And you can actually hear why they call this samurai chatter, because it's, it's such a staccato, very deep staccato. I don't know how, how many of you remember an old, uh, the old samurai uh, movies, TV series from the, what, 70s? You know, where they talk, I don't speak Japanese, but that's kind of what they sound like. It's very deep, staccato voice. Uh, that's why they ended up calling this samurai chatter. So, so I took this up, Jerry, listen to this stuff. So I played him some of these snippets, and he goes, he goes, oh, my God, Scott, that, that sounds like an ancient form of Japanese. And I said, well, um, what are they saying? He says, I have no clue. It just sounds like an old form of Japanese, or like samurai, right? He said, yeah. I said, <laughs> he said, had no clue what they were saying. And then he, later on, he had some little, uh, on Ron's tape, I had him listen to a couple of things. Boy, that word, mwo, kuma, rake. That sounds like a very ancient, archaic uh, warning. And I said, well, that would, that would be appropriate, I think, right? Now, here's the problem is I have played these sounds for people of every language group. And no matter who I play it for, they begin to hear little snippets that they think, oh, my God. You know, I played it for, and I played it for probably you know, these seven different Native American tribes from Navajo to Cherokee to Shoshone up in Utah, um, Idaho. And everybody, it doesn't matter who it is, English, Spanish, I've played it for. I've played it for uh, uh, Persian, um, Russian, and Spanish, of course. Uh, and even ancient Avestan, which I'm doing a peripheral study uh, in ancient uh, scripture of the uh, the Zoroastrians, they spoke in a, an ancient form of Persian. I even have, have detected words in that, right? So here's the problem with cognatic expressions or language is that humans have an extraordinary ability to tr and, and a need to try to make sense out of something that absolutely does make, makes no sense. We have that need, and it's, it's actually, there's a word for it, which is uh, pareidolia, pareidolia, and the, the Webster definition is an imagined perception of a pattern or meaning where it does not actually exist. So that's what we're finding out in the study of this. Um, is no matter who it is that's listening to it, will eventually begin hearing things from their own native language. So we have to be careful of that. Now, do we have to include it in our study? Of course. We have to say, okay, according to this Cherokee speaker, it sounds like he's saying whatever here. So we have to make those transcriber notes right, in our study. That's why it's going to be so big. <laughs> um, so that's, that's why here, that's why I brought it up here, because I've had people say, oh, the, the female is saying, thank you for the food, now go home. Uh, and believe me, at every Bigfoot conference I've been to, I've got guys 
waiting for me out in the hallway saying, oh my God, I know, I heard him, I heard him say this, right? Or this comes from, you know, come up with some Egyptian language or some ancient thing. And well, that's interesting, but we cannot actually say that. Right? So let's uh, go on and hear some more sound. How are we doing on time, by the way, boys? How much? 20? Okay. Again, we have this at... There's another spot. What do you say? Oh, okay, that's a good spot here, too. Having just t talked you out of hearing things, <laughs> now I'm going to talk you into hearing things. Um, this is... I've had people tell me here that this is that right here he says it's it's time for resistance. <laughs> like it's the auto workers union or something, you know? <laughs> and and it really does sound like that, that she is saying that. Um, and then the next one, we'll we will slow it down and loop it. She actually says the morpheme food. F how I have transcribed it, F-U-D, food. And she says it twice in the same articulation, in the same utterance. Now, the interesting part about that is here, here, the, here the, the, the hunters are, and the guys out there are going, hey, Biggie, come down, get some dinner. Come down, get some, get some you know, trying to distract them. He never says the word food. Yet, almost in this same breath, the female Sasquatch says the word food twice. And as I've slowed it down, and you will hear it as I loop it, it almost says, I'm paying attention on food. I'm paying attention to the food. She says the word, literally, um, me watch food, plan food. This would be a perfect Creole for saying, I'm watching the food and there's plenty of it. Me watch food, plan food. I'll play that for you. Let's see, first we'll come back here a bit. Ooh. Okay, right here. It's time for us for resistance. Now, if, if, if I played that at real time, it wouldn't sound anything like this. In fact, I will. Okay. Look this here. Now, first I'll play it at... Um, no, you know what? I'll, I'm going to play it at real time, at 100% real time and let you hear it that way, and then I'll slow it down, and you'll hear the difference. You, see, you can hear it starts to come down, slow it down, enough for us to, uh, to, it's actually even begins sounding human to us, right? It sounds like more like a, a female human voice, right? Okay. <laughs> I'll slow it down a touch more. See. No, for Bikinia. 
Gigo, whoop! Uh, me watch food, plain food. Of course, you don't hear that at 100% real time. Again, it sounds like apes fighting. I've also heard it described as coyote. Oh, that's just coyotes fighting. By the way, ladies and gentlemen, if you were ever out in the woods and happen to have, be lucky enough to have a tape recorder and you hear coyotes fighting, right? Please record it for me. All right, it may sound like, <laughs> um, it may sound like nothing to you, but you never know. Um, so let me show to play this again. And again, she says the, um, the, word, the morpheme, not word, morpheme, food, two times. Right here. You can hear that morphine, food, uttered twice. There has to be meaning to that. And it just so happens that there's a giant pot of pretty good Irish stew out there, you know. So these are things that we do have to pay attention to in the study, but we can't come out and say that until I'm able to sit down with this lady and say, ma'am, did you mean the stew when you said the word food up here? Because I noticed that the cowboys didn't say the word food. They said dinner. Come get some dinner. Um, so, okay, well, uh, how are we doing on time? Still, what? I really wanted to spend a little bit more time, but I, I feel it was more important to let you guys hear all of this because, uh, because this is a, a um, UFO convention. I wanted to spend a little bit more time in, in telling you about the um, high, what we, me and Ron call it the high strangeness of some of the things that have gone on up there. Um, and it started from the original time me and Ron tried to get up there uh, with his horses, um, his, his pack animal, uh, there was something that did not want us to make it up there to that camp our first time. First off, the, uh, to know, no one knows where this place is. Only me, uh, Ron, and now, and a couple of Ron's buddies, the old hunter guys, right? And, um, and Dave Palides. We took Dave Palides up there a couple years ago. And some bad stuff. Bad stuff happened. Um, and he, we took him up there because he wanted to use me and Ron in a, as part of the last segment of his movie 411, The Hunted. And if you ever see that movie, you'll see me and Ron around the campfire. There at this, this is the only time the Sierra camp has ever been filmed, was for uh, Dave, Dave's movie. Um, but long before that, that uh, we had, like I say, 10 expeditions up there. And the thing is that sometimes absolutely nothing happens. Absolutely nothing. But then there's other times when you, uh, anybody that's ever done much Sasquatch hunting knows that you can feel them. If they're observing you, you can actually feel them because you get a feeling, of, you know. I mean, and you can experiment. Humans can actually feel someone else behind them. Look at them and go, there's something strange ability of humans that they can do that. Well, Sasquatch seem to have the ability to really you know, zero in on you and, and make you feel very, very uncomfortable. That's even before they hit you with what they call the infrasound, which a lot of animals have. Elephants have it. Tigers have it. Well, they'll freeze one of their prey animals so they can get them. But, um, it's, it's like you feel like your chest is exploding. I've been hit with it only t 
two times and not up on the Sierra camp. Up there, it's just you have the feeling you know. The other way that we can tell where they're around is our re recording equipment acts differently. If they're there and you can feel them, I've had the best voice recorders you can buy up there, and we always pack up there enough lithium batteries, top-of-line batteries, uh, 10 more than we would ever need. Okay. First couple times we went up there, Ron tried to take his, his, uh, his camera, his uh, video camera. But this is what happens when they're there. Okay, and we put brand new batteries in. You can actually watch the indicator, the battery indicator, <laughs> almost that fast. It drains almost immediately. You can actually see the, the thing move. Change them out, plug it back in. So there's something going on there. These, these are not dumb monkeys that are doing this to techno, you know, on purpose to, to equipment. Um, so after the first couple times, Ron didn't even bother taking his, his uh, video recorder up there anymore. I always took my little, you know, voice recorder, but uh, it never did us any good. So that, that's often a question I get. Why didn't you ever tape them? Hey, you got this tape. I think what happened here with these was a perfect storm. I think this was an accident. That, oh, well, if you believe in accidents anymore. I'm not sure I do. I believe more in, in... I don't believe in coincidence or accidents. I believe in synchronicity. There's a reason that we're all here tonight. There's a reason that we are all drawn to this. There's a reason that by some off chance, I was sitting in my classroom with my son and happened to stumble onto this. And, you know, it's changed my life. It's changed uh, Sasquatch studies. Again, when we started out, it was a giant, you know, Gigantopithecus gorilla. Now we know that they are so much closer to us they even have the same articulations, the same tracheal tree as, as humans do. We have to assume that they are sentient creatures. So, again, <laughs> I'm still left with the same conclusions that I, I drew that very first day. It's a language. They're not human, and it's not fake. Thank you guys for having me. How are you? You've got a few minutes left if you want to take questions, but only like okay, six or seven. Okay. I don't want taking a question, but if you will, uh, if you have a question, please come up here to this uh, square up here so that we can hear your question, first of all, and we can see you ask it. Um, yeah, I, I was interested in the transcripts you made. I couldn't see well enough to read them exactly, but are you using the phonetic alphabet or something um, else? This is, that's a great question. Because, no, I invented my own alphabet for this, the phonetic. That's why I had to call it and publish the Sasquatch phonetic alphabet. I would think it, it wouldn't work for all the sounds because you can't duplicate all the sounds, right? Um, virtually all the sounds that they make are sounds that humans make with a couple of additional ones put, thrown in there. For instance, they have tooth pops, which they actually have in some human languages. I can't do it good, but they have gigantic teeth, and they can make a big pop sound, you know, and step over here, I don't know if, um, but, uh, and they also use uh, tongue clicks. How about the throat click that the Africans' languages, some do? Oh, uh, yes, yes, tongue clicks, throat, yes, uh, guttural throat clicks, uh, tooth pops, yeah, tongue clicks, yeah. Thanks, like I was that. curious, um, thanks. But, I'm going to uh, 
add to, to, your, to answer your question, you asked about a phonetic alphabet. Right. Okay, so I've been, I've been asked this by linguists, professional linguists, linguistics experts or linguistics specialists, which I'm not. I'm a language specialist. Linguistics is the science behind, um, oh, how does the human mouth make the P sound? Okay, P. Okay, well, you have to put the two lips together and push air out of it. That's the science behind linguistics, okay? You can be a, a PhD linguistics specialist and not be able to speak a word in a foreign language. The problem there becomes because we are both referred to as linguists, a language expert and a linguistics expert. There really should be two different words. Okay. But, uh, and so I get asked very often, why didn't you use the IPA, the International Phonetic yeah, yeah, Alphabet? Yeah. Well, <laughs> okay, hoity-toity. Uh, the reason is, is because the IPA was invented for, was invented for lingui specialists in linguistics, right? And they had the strangest looking little letters and I created this so that it would be um, an easy tool for researchers. That's the real reason I didn't use the IPA. Hi. Hi, uh, my question is, have you ever thought about using an animal communicator to, because the, my understanding is, is all beings can speak telepathy. Oh, telepathy. Uh, but animal communicators, they communicate with the animals through telepathy. Uh, no. No, I can't say we have. But would that uh, you be... Mean, you mean like... Uh, uh, well, we think they have what we, what you, we call mind speak. Mm -hmm. We do think that. Um, but you, what purpose would we use them for? To, to try to t talk to the Sasquatches? Infinite. We feel like we do that enough. We try, I mean, we try to physically speak to them mm -hmm. by, like, what I do up there is I shout out, you know, and, or I read off of the transcripts themselves as close as I can come, and as far as I know, I'm the best mimicker of Sasquatch language that <laughs> of anybody I've met, so I'm so practiced well, at it. But, um, so that's kind of beyond what, what we would... Uh, because a communicator could tell you what those sounds mean mm -hmm. by talking to the critter. Mm -hmm. Telepathy. Well, the, the other problem with that it would be to, because this is going to be an academic paper, it, it's, it would be hard to establish someone like that as, as being illegitimate. Now, to me, I believe. I believe in that kind of stuff, right? But academics would frown on that kind of stuff unless it was further, we'd have to further prove, a st um, create a study that animal communicators that there was real evidence that that was legitimate that before we could ever use them in, in okay. something like this. But well, it's a great, is legitimate. It's I a great you. idea. Yeah. I've experienced with my animals before. And there's a lady out in California that is exceptional in that um, I lost a pet. And I was real upset about it. So <laughs> I searched this woman out. And in my opinion, she's one of the best. Ah. And I was talking to her on that the... That may be something we can try to do l later in the future. But let me tell you why I believe well, she... Can we talk after? Can we sure. speak after? Sure, sure. So, yes. Uh, any more quick questions? Or if not, I think... Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think we're at time. And, and at thank time? you so much for trying to so, stick to my, time. My <laughs> pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you all. <laughs>